Good evening, 49er faithful. Welcome to another episode of the Hammerhead Show. It has been a little while since we had one of these, and they're one of my favorite shows to do. So I'm excited to have my co-host here. I'm Rob Shue. That is Jack Hammer. Hence how you get the Hammerhead Show. Bringing home the Hammerhead Shark, the Sneakerhead. You combine it all together, you get hammerheads and here we are thursday night at a unique time but probably one that we are going to be going with going forward jack it is fantastic to see you welcome back on the program how are you doing this evening i'm good i'm good i'm excited i haven't seen you for a while and it's funny you know i was driving home tonight and i was thinking Fuck, man it's been only it's it's been three months since i sat down and had dinner with rob in chicago for week one it feels like it was just like, you know, a couple of weeks ago and we're the, we're now at the, at the end of the season here three months later. It's just wild to me. It's really is wild. I was just thinking about that dinner uh, last night myself. And yes, it, it feels like it's simultaneously like it just happened. And relative to the season having passed us by, like <laughs> it has significant <laughs> time has passed. I want to say what's up to all those that are here in the chat. Always appreciate the enthusiastic additions that you all bring to the show. Spy Nick Danger doing the good deed, encouraging those that are here early to hit that like button. Get Jack and I amplified. Shoot that signal out there into Niner Faithful Land. Cowboy Angel says Thursday night football battle of the bums. Yeah, you've got Las Vegas taking on the Rams. Uh, Hey, Baker Mayfield is in. There's something at least to watch. There's an entertainment factor going on there. Who knows if, if Baker can do anything in the second half that makes it a game or not. I just need Devontae Adams to have a hell of a game, Jack. I, my fantasy football in one league, making the playoffs, is riding on this week. I need Devontae Adams to have himself a strong second half. There you go. There you go. That's that's, that's the whole reason to watch these second, these bad games, right? That's right. You always have somebody who's going in one of these games. Either you're going up against a team or you have one on your own. Raphael 5629er Sneakerhead here on the channel says, what's up to me, Jack, all the sneakerheads and everybody. Randall Riley coming in celebrating Christmas early. Also a sneakerhead shoe two nights in a row. It's like Christmas Day, two weeks early. I love it. Scott Hill in the building. Tommy Hugsley coming in. The real goat is here. Yes, the real goat being Jack, of course. Absolutely. Luke Walsh coming in to say hello. Alan Eliza Sneakerhead here on the channel. Good evening. I'm so excited to see the dynamic duo again. Devil that like button, y'all. I'm telling you, the people are fired up. Uh, Sean 951 Niners is here. Bang, bang, Niner gang. We got Lucas in the house saying hello. He's at SoFi Stadium at the moment. <laughs> He's at SoFi texting with us i love that i mean that's 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 the type of fan base that we have here jack it is amazing lucas is coming to us from austria so he's making the trip to the states and so he's in sofi tonight he's going to be at levi's on sunday i didn't know he was going to sofi but that's an awesome trip right there man that is fantastic lucas i i am happy for you in that phenomenal trip okay so I wanted to start this off jack by getting your sense of the 49ers because i i'll be honest that I came out of last week's game with mixed emotions. And I think many 49er faithful did. You obviously very excited for the 49ers to have won five straight, extremely saddened for Jimmy Garoppolo, as I was for Trey Lance. You never want to see something like that happen, especially in a season where you feel like you have a legitimate shot at a Super Bowl at that title. And I was fairly excited by what I saw from Brock Purdy coming in in relief for Jimmy. So I was all over the place and it got me thinking as to whether the 49ers are all over the place themselves. They have been thinking that Jimmy was out for the year. Then there's a little bit of news comes out. Hey, maybe he's not six to eight weeks. That could put him coming back right at the start of the playoffs, maybe at the NFC championship game. If we can get that far, Kyle Shanahan comes back out, puts a little bit of water on that optimism. So it feels as if we have been up and down. You are my source of truth, Jack, because you have the access that we all crave getting into pressers, practices, uh, post practice pressers, man, that's a mouthful right there. And, and so you get to actually see this in person. What's been your impression of the 49ers spirits at this point? Do you think that they have had their spirits dampened by the fact that that Jimmy Garoppolo is out, or is there still optimism in the building? 
I think there's still a lot of optimism. They're still, you know, they're still a bounce in everybody's step. Um, you know, they're coming off a big win against a really good team. And so I think that helps them to be a little bit more optimistic coming out of, uh, out of that game against Miami heading into Tampa Bay this week. And they're not looking at, I don't think they are looking at the full season. You know, they're doing what they need to do, which is they focus on one week at a time. That's not what we do, but that's what the, the team has to try to do. Do you think that the optimism around Brock Purdy, and we'll, we'll obviously get to talking about Brock in a little bit with more specifics, but Trent Williams coming out and saying, hey, he, he exudes extreme confidence. It, it's not cockiness. It, it's not misplaced. It just is self-assured. It, do you think that the sense is the 49ers locker room has faith in, in Brock Purdy to, to step up and compete at a level that they're going to need to continue winning? I think that they feel like they have the talent in the room to withstand it. it what I've heard from them reminds me a lot of what we heard from them over the off season as we were getting like ramping up and through uh, OTAs and mini camp and then the being a training camp and everybody would ask about Trey and where's Trey, where's Trey Lance, you know, and how are you, how's he going to be early on? And the, the thing that you heard constantly during that time was, we have a lot of people here. Trey just needs to get the ball to the right guys. Let them do this. You know, we, we've got his back. He just needs to basically not screw it up is what they were saying without saying it. And they've been saying the same exact Fred Warner in particular. He said, basically that's, he said something the other on Sunday that I, it's almost exactly what he said about Trey Lance. And that's, he just, he's got to play makers, get him the ball and, and, and go do what you do. That does leave me feeling good because that's what I'm viewing this team as as well, that it's just too talented to really believe that they're out of the running simply because they've transitioned. Now, they do need at least average level quarterback play to your point and, and Fred Warner's point specifically. It has to be avoiding those costly turnovers that could shoot the 49ers in the foot, right? They cannot Brock cannot lose games for the 49ers, but as long as he is able to distribute the ball, we do have enough playmakers on offense that we should still be productive. And certainly this defense is getting back to that cooking level where they've established themselves once again as the number one defense in the NFL. And now we are yet again talking about them in the same company as some of the more elite defenses that we've seen over the years. I just read the article that you put out on the uh, Press Democrat today, which, by the way, the links for that are down below in the description of the video. I know that this wasn't intended to be a part of our topic right here. This is more getting a sense of, of the feel of the 49ers locker room. But I just wanted to turn that around and, and, and ask you your sense of optimism. And the article that, that you put out today talked about some of the reasons that it's not out of the question to still set our eyes on the prize. Do you believe that's actually the case that those factors you listed out and I'll allow you to, to talk about those at a high level really do set up this team to be the first one to get to the Super Bowl with a rookie quarterback, potentially winning it. I, I think if, if, if you look through it, you know, go back really quick. And if you take one step back to what I wrote last week, because last week I wrote that the 49ers, if Jimmy, for, the 49ers' future for this season, Super Bowl hopes ride with Jimmy Garoppolo's health. Well, Jimmy Garoppolo is now out. I mean, I, I guess, right. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, everybody. I, I'm yeah. sorry. It's my fault because I wrote that. And then you, you put know, the it, kibosh out there, man. It, hey, it happens to the best of the announcers out there, Jack. It, it, I heard him right away. And and so that, you know, that happened. And now you've got you've got me saying that they still could win the soup, you know, get there. Uh I was trying to be very careful in how I put that out there, though, because I didn't really put if you if when you read the article, you notice there's really not anything about Brock Purdy other than him not screwing it up. And the fact that it's never happened before. Right. There, there's never been a rookie that's ever made it to the Super Bowl as the starter. And there's definitely never won one. So for the foreigners to get there, it would be a, a historical event. It would have been a historical event if Jimmy Garoppolo had got them back to the Super Bowl and won it this year just to put that out there. Uh, so it, it'll be, they have a good team, Nick Bosa, what he's done what Christian McCaffrey and how he's changed his offense. I included Debo in there too, because of what they can do. And then what Brian Greasy's doing, heck, I think this team could, could, they're going to put up a fight. I think we're going to find, we're, we're going to know a lot more by Sunday night at four 30. 
It does feel like a big test, absolutely a big test for the 49ers offense coming up against a a much more ferocious defense in Tampa Bay and a defense that now has a week to prepare for the rookie quarterback. I have to assume that that is going to make a difference. Just in closing out the, the original topic, at any point from any of the players, other than expressing their sentiments around Jimmy Garoppolo and obviously the feelings of, of pain for one of their brothers uh, going through what he's gone through. And now this again, have you gotten a sense from anyone really that the wind has been taken out of their sails? No, it doesn't seem like it. They, I think, I think they have a lot of confidence in themselves and uh, you know, there's a lot of talent in that room. That's the whole thing is that is a very talented team and Go back to what we said. I, I, I still, it's it's like where we were before week one. The discussion was that the foreigners have the best roster in the NFL, minus the quarterback position. If you take the quarterback out of it, they have the best roster. I think that's still the case, and the quarterback just needs to make some plays. And if they can, if if they can get Brock Purdy to play uh, the rest of the way, the way that he played on Sunday against the Dolphins, they'll be okay. That's a big ask, I think, for a rookie. That is a big ass, but he did look good. And Sean 9519ers, sneakerhead here on the channel, coming in to say as much, saying, Rob, Jimmy G got three points on Sunday. Purdy came in and had the offense on the field for 40 minutes, put up 23 points, defense got seven, and got everyone involved. If he does that again, means he is good on third down. No difference then between he and Jimmy G. I can't go that far. I recognize Jimmy G, the, the number of starts that he has, the NFL experience. I mean, it took him until this year to, to markedly improve in the efficiency metric of touchdown to interception ratio to really get to where he was operating this F, uh, offense at super high efficiency. And I liked your uh, article mentioning Brian Greasy specifically as one of those factors that played into Jimmy G finally throwing the ball away uh, instead of taking a, a bonehead sack or throwing it to a defender as he had in the past. And it seems those simple adjustments have helped Jimmy Garoppolo. I would expect that we see some struggles for Brock Purdy. And, and again, I think NFL defenses will be able to capitalize on his lack of experience, but he is a four-year starter. And within this offense, quite frankly, his last year at Iowa there through 71% completion percentage, I feel like he has the skill set that matches up with this offense and all of those skill position players that you mentioned and those players taking it upon themselves instead of turning to Purdy and saying, well, he just has to be good, does seem to take some pressure off of him. Yeah, he, he's a, he, there are some things that he did really well when you watch the film. Uh, there's the, the, the throw to Juwan Jennings on third and five is a really nice one because you see him look to the left. You see him move a linebacker out of the way so that he, it opens up the middle for the completion there. You, you hear about him talking to George Kittle prior to that third down and 10 completion, telling him that he needs to get be, be ready quick. And so, you know, and, and even on that snap, you see him looking to his left to move the linebacker a little bit over to his left. And I mean, those are high level quarterback things to be able to do that. That's stuff that uh, first round draft pick, I don't, haven't seen a whole lot of them do that. So, right. And you know, the four year starter thing is very big. I mean, there are old school NFL coaches that that was one of their criteria was X number of starts in college, just so that, you know, you're having an experienced guy coming in that grasps a lot of those concepts. Yeah, he, he really seems like he has a pretty good feel for it. For With, with Brock Purdy, we, I'm not sure if we're going to get into him more, but with Purdy, the biggest thing is he just needs to be, he needs to, he needs to get it accurate. His, he's not a huge struggle with that in the beginning of the game. Yeah, especially some of those earlier throws. I agree with Joseph here, Joseph559. The fact we have Yak guys really benefits Glock Purdy. I also like that uh, nickname. It's a little more PG-13 <laughs> than the uh, other version that George Kittle blessed us with in BCB. All right, let's transition to the run game because we've got people talking about it. Tommy Huxley, sneakerhead here on the channel, says Tampa Bay is 18th against the run. They are the ninth overall defense as far as that goes. Uh, how How is that hard to run on? Oh, so talking to someone else in the chat there, I'm assuming, because I don't think that you or I have said they'll be hard to run on in this one, but that's the transition because I want to talk about Jordan Mason. Jack, you were the man that early in camp said to me, hey, 
as far as guys I've got my eye on, seen a little something out of Jordan Mason. You got me hyped early on, and I've been on the Jordan Mason train for a while now. We are finally seeing him get some carries and show great efficiency with them. Now, he hasn't gotten a, a huge number of carries, but again, the, what he has done with them is phenomenally uh, phenomenal, especially when you take into consideration the fact that he did need to salt away uh, the game on, on some of those runs that he was averaging five a carry in that four minute mode a couple of games ago. Do you believe he's finally earned the trust of the coaching staff or is that still a work in process? No, I think he's he's earned it. That's why he was the number two back on on Sunday, and they didn't do anything on Sunday to uh, move himself down that list of the at all. He had a really good start to the game. Struggled in the second half of his carries. His first four carries were excellent. His last, second four, not so much. But I think he earned the, their trust. Uh, like you said, really the week before with the, what he did in the, at the end of that game, and I think he earned their trust there. And he's just continuing to build upon that. Do you think that we will actually see the, the carries split a bit more evenly going forward? I have to assume that it will be a, a one-two punch so long as both he and CMC are in the game. It, it seems as though Kyle Shanahan has no problem leaning on Christian McCaffrey, although his percentage of touches within the offense hasn't been absurd. Certainly, he was getting the bulk of them in Carolina, so he's proven that he can, is capable of taking that do you believe that there will be more balance the more Mason shows us? I don't think so because they want to they want to have Christian McCaffrey on the field because of everything that he does. Um, that and that's one of the biggest reasons why they went out and, and picked him up is because now with 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 Christian McCaffrey, Cal Shane, I was listening to him today while I was driving home. He was on on the radio, you know, and there's really he really liked the balance of McCaffrey and. Um, the running Elijah back Mitchell. Defender now, Elijah Mitchell. Thank you. And, you know, he kind of mentioned Jordan Mason and, and Ty Davis price, but they're not, they're not at that same, they're not the same type of back. At least Jordan Mason isn't the same kind of back as Elijah Mitchell. He's more of a, a slasher kind of a guy with, with what I, the way I see him run the ball. So it, it's a little, it's a little similar, a little different. I, I'm, I'm a little surprised that maybe Ty Davis price isn't getting the, the, the Elijah Mitchell carries right those, those in between the tackle runs. Uh, but they want to keep Christian McCaffrey out there. He's he's averaging over 105 yards per game uh, since he started for the 49ers in the five weeks that he's played. Do you think that it's a, a bigger factor just how electric McCaffrey is with the ball or what him being out there on larger percentages of, of the snaps does to the defense in what they have to account for because of his versatility and explosiveness? I think it's a it's what they have to account for because having I'm not sure they're they trust Jordan Mason as a running back. I'm not sure if they trust Jordan Mason and Ty Davis Price as receivers. So that's why you're seeing Christian McCaffrey on the field more. And I think that's why Christian McCaffrey has been such a big piece of what their success over these last five six weeks is because of his ability to quarterbacks don't have to take risks anymore. If the if the throw is not there, you check it down to Christian McCaffrey, let him pick up nine yards, he move the sticks, you go to the next play. Much easier. I mean in lockstep with you on that, as is Sean 9519 er saying, Rob, you must have Christian McCaffrey on the field every third down to help Purdy with blitz, but the dump off there. It's it's remarkable what he's able to do with the ball in space, and he's just quite the receiver for a running back. I mean, obviously, we have seen some incredible catches to this point, but it's it's special to watch him. I still go through moments where I'm like, how the hell did we get Christian McCaffrey on this team? Like, how is he a 49er? I see that 23 in the red and gold and it still trips me out. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's such a, it's, it's been such a difference with the offense. I think I, I know they're not necessarily lighting the scoreboard up, but they've been much more efficient. They're moving, they're getting a lot more first downs. I think I counted up today. I was looking at it. He's got, he's picked up 31 first downs in the last five games. Uh, and four touchdowns. So that's that's pretty high, you know, quality play for for an offensive weapon that he is. Yes, he's helping my fantasy team in one league, Jack. I, I tell you, Christian <laughs> McCaffrey, no slouch there. Uh, do you see this as going back to the Jordan Mason topic, closing it out? Do you think that once we get Mitchell back, assuming we do get to the playoffs or whenever Mitchell is ready, if that's at the tail end of the season and we're fighting for our playoff lives, would you expect this to be a, a one, two, three combination, or do you think it'll just go back to, to Mitchell and Christian McCaffrey once Mitchell is fully healthy again? I think it'll go back to a one, two, 
combination between Mitchell and, and McCaffrey with Mason being the, the guy that's the you know active because of special teams and every once in a while he's going to pick up a carry here or there. Any concern from the simple fact that Tyrion Davis Price was the only Niner without a snap on Sunday, or is that just the pecking order of the running back room? It's just the pecking order of the of the room. Yeah, you know, I, that was a pick that I wasn't really happy, wasn't really all that high on. Right. So, you know, I, you know, I, he's a solid player. He does some things well, but uh, they've definitely Mason's a much more explosive player, and that's why he's getting the run. Hey, they take two stabs at this pretty consistently and and seems like it's a good thing that they do double dipping on the running backs. Maybe the lesson is stop taking some of these guys so early, but certainly the bigger lesson is if you do double down again, because you have hit some home <laughs> runs on those later picks, even if you may not have hit on one of the earlier ones. Not that I'm saying it's it's so early that you can't write off Tyrion Davis Price. He obviously could emerge and be a wonderful player for the organization just hasn't contributed at the level you would expect for the draft pick this particular season. All right, let's talk about people that that may currently be flying a little bit under the radar. And that is uh, Ray Ray McLeod and and the special teams units on both sides of the ball. Um, I've been pretty impressed to this point What has been your impression of the special teams unit and the improvement that they seem to have shown from the start of the season until now, obviously with a new special teams coach in place for the season? Well, they've definitely improved. And and I I mentioned Ray Ray McLeod a little bit the other day on my show because he didn't make the article that I wrote up on Monday as far as the guys that stood out. He did, but I was trying to limit to 10. Uh, I should have put him in there because what he did on special teams and and the punt returns in particular was a big piece for the four hours. I think he had, uh, two returns for 34 yards, and one of them was a 20-yarder, so a 20 and a 14-yard punt return. That's not something we've seen from the foreigners in the last couple of years. So that's a, a big positive. So that's good there, and uh, you know their coverage units seem to have been have improved as well. So uh, they're definitely picking it up on that side. Has there been an update on Tavarius Moore, who has been one of our uh, two gunners uh, up to this point, and and has been playing well? Well, he has a knee injury. He's going to be out for a couple of weeks. So uh, I wouldn't expect to see him play. Um, he's not going to be in the game on against Tampa. I doubt that because of that, he probably won't be in there Seattle. So look for him uh, when, they, when the 49ers Christmas Eve against Washington. Does this serve as a precursor to the return of Dante Johnson? Do you believe Dante Johnson will get uh, elevated in the next couple of weeks? Yeah, Dante Johnson or maybe even uh, – uh, Janoris Jenkins, who knows? Man, if hey, if we have Josh Johnson and and Dante Johnson active on the same day, that's just I saw someone on the athletic in the comment section on a Matt Barrows uh, article calling out the Barnacle Bros. I mean, it's just perfect. It, they have the same last name. They both have been Barnacles in the league, and they definitely have been around the 49ers organization quite a bit. I, I, I'm thrilled to uh, to see them both still out there, still making contributions. I mean, certainly for Dante Johnson, making contributions. When you look at, uh, clearly, Mitch Wisnowski has has been having himself a a year throughout the entirety of it. Are are you comfortable with where the 49ers special teams is right now and with the way uh, Robbie Gold is kicking? Do you think that they will contribute uh, going forward with the Niners needing everybody to step up? obviously losing Jimmy Garoppolo. Is that one of the strengths that we can lean on going forward? Yeah, for the most part. You've seen the the kicking game has been fine in terms of the kickers, that they've had some issues with the blocking in front of them as far as you know on the field goals earlier on right. in the year, but that seems to have cleared itself up for the most part. So I think they're in a pretty good spot moving forward with their their specialists. Fable JVC coming in. Thank you for pointing out how much our punt and kick returns are, uh, how much better they are now with Ray Ray McLeod, Jack. Absolutely underscore that. When I look at Ray Ray for a shifty guy, he runs angrily. He, he seems to welcome the contact and has run through several tacklers that I've seen. And I watch him before the play and after the play, and he seems to get himself hyped up for it. That's also what leads me to be just a little concerned because he has the you know ball security issues and you, you combine that with running very violently and violent collisions. That can be a recipe for disaster. But to this point, it really has been something to watch and, and truly has been an advantage 
for the 49ers. I appreciate you pointing that out. Schnozzle, shabizzle, I always love saying that handle, comes in to say what's up, shoe and hammer. What's up to you, schnozzle, shabizzle? Great name. Great yes. name. Uh, much like uh, Glock Purdy. Great name. Uh, let's get into a little bit of mindset here. Obviously, it's pretty rare, although twice now in Kyle Shanahan's tenure, to lose your starting quarterback for the season and then presumably lose your second string uh, quarterback for the season. It happened to Kyle in 2018, and here it is again. Could this potentially be a benefit here, Jack? And and, and I'm going to throw out the, the premise for how it could be a benefit. We're talking about the idea that there are still expectations for this team. Obviously, talented roster, national media is still talking about Super Bowl. I'm still talking about Super Bowl. You're still talking about Super Bowl. Everyone's still talking about the Super Bowl. But the expectations have to be lower when you're turning to Mr. Irrelevant to be the quarterback of the team. Obviously, if you didn't have the roster around it, there would be very little as far as expectations. When you look at it now, first question I have for you is, is there more or less pressure on Kyle Shanahan now that he's down to his third string quarterback? I think personally, there's probably more pressure on him. And I think in some ways there's less pressure from outside because now he has, there's a built-in excuse for the thing goes south. There's, there's a fan base that's going to be, ah, it's Brock Purdy. That's why they're losing. Just like they've been doing, you know, the same stuff we've, we've said in the past with the guys who aren't named Jimmy Garoppolo, right? Ah, those guys suck. So if if Brock Purdy sucks, then it's uh, it's it's not it's not Kyle Shanahan's fault that Brock Purdy sucks. He's supposed to suck. He was a seventh you know seventh round pick at the end of the draft. So right. So I think the the pressure comes from in, inside, and I think the inside that building, I think they're they're I think they feel they're in a much better position than than um, and, and kind of I think that's why we're seeing some of the stuff that we're seeing from the national media. Shanahan often, I mean, he's all about winning games and, and he doesn't care what we think as long as he is winning games and he will do what he feels is right in order to win a game. And, and you will watch at times when it's a close matchup that he gets, as fans would characterize it, conservative. And I think an old school NFL head, much like his father, would just argue that you got to play the game the way in which it's unraveling, the way in which it's unfolding. So if, if you have a close defensive matchup, then you don't take as many chances. You, you play a little more conservatively. You, you chew the clock. If it's a, a shootout, then you're going to go for it on more third and longs, fourth and longs. You're going to be more aggressive on those downs is what I mean to say. Do you believe that being down to Brock Purdy as his quarterback, Shanahan will adjust his play calling and be a little bit more aggressive because some of that pressure is on him to perform as the play caller? No, I think he'll be exactly what he was on Sunday with Brock Purdy, which was he managed that game very well. When when the 49ers were behind, when Brock Purdy first came in, they were they, they started off running. He got in, he got him into a little bit of a rhythm. They made a couple of plays. They score a touchdown. Now up ten to they're up ten to seven. So once they're since they're up ten to seven, if you you know watch the way that game flowed, when they were up ten to seven, it was kind of a conservative conservative process, right? And then and then the Dolphins score and make it ten to ten, and then the 49ers get the ball with two and a half minutes, and it's you know, Brock Purdy throws the ball. They, they throw the ball, I think it was 11 play drive or something like that. And they throw the ball nine times, you know, and, and he's managing the game based on the situation, not trying to overwork any aspect of the game. And uh, I don't see him all of a sudden deciding he's going to just completely throw out what he's already been doing. He has been fairly consistent. And it is fair to point out that in transitioning from Jimmy Garoppolo to Brock Purdy, it's actually a more seamless transition than the first one that happened this season in going from Trey Lance to Jimmy Garoppolo. If you simply look at the skill sets that that both possess, other than the experience and, and the gamesmanship and, and other intangibles that Jimmy Garoppolo has, when I look at the skill sets, I see them as fairly similar. Yeah, the first one, I, I found that answer that that he gave the other day to be very interesting how he was saying, you know, the transition from from Trey to Jimmy was much tougher than the transition from Jimmy to to Brock, because, you know, when, when Trey was there, there was asked, they were focused on 
the running aspect and the way they're building the, the formations around. So he was always a runner and those types of things. And now it's not, that's not there. So they just, I think that says a lot about what they feel they have in the quarterbacks. And, and uh, it's an interesting one because I, I really think there's, it's, it's, I think they're really better off with what they're doing right now. I have to put in Sean 951 enthusiastically agrees with you, Jack, which is no surprise. You're always spitting facts on the show. He says, Jack, exactly. Nothing changes. Shanny threw 37 times. J49 came in to pay us a compliment. You know that's always going to make it on screen because it, it is a nice show. It continues to be a wonderful show. And Jaguayo 56 with our first super chat coming in to say, Rob and Jack Purdy has to execute the game plan. No turnovers. Is that the biggest factor for Purdy? I tend to think so in response to Jaguayo here. Do you believe that that whether he does or does not turn the ball over will be the biggest factor in whether the 49ers win or lose? Yes, that's that's it. Because you go back to everybody, when we look at the 2020 season, everybody looks at the 2020 season, and the one thing that they point to is the reason why the 49ers didn't make the playoffs in 2020 and why it was down year was because – one of the things they point to was the number of injuries they had. Right. When in when in reality, I think the reason that that team wasn't a playoff team was because the quarterback play was not competent and they were turning the ball over and there was pick sixes and fumbles returned for touchdowns and all those kind of things that killed them in games that they should have won. You know, there, there was at least three, maybe four games that uh, having – either C.J. Bathard at the end of the season, the, the Seattle game, that's a win if you have competent quarterback play. The, right. the game against Washington, and there was one other one, probably Dallas, those are games that you win if you have a, if you had Jimmy Garoppolo on the field. If Brock Purdy just doesn't turn the ball over, makes a couple of plays, and gets the ball to, D, to Debo and to Brandon and to Christian, the playmakers, th this is a team that's – they should be okay. I don't know if they're going to actually score 25, 28 points, but they're going to score 20, which based off of what the Farmers defense has done this year is enough to win. Yeah, if if their defense is holding teams to an average of somewhere around 16 points, hey, getting it to 20 may not be super pretty all the time, but that's going to win a lot of games. And, and at the end of the day, that is what we're trying to do. Don't have to win too many more. I read today, by the way, I'm just very excited about this. I don't I don't predict that this is what happens because it requires Seattle to lose to Carolina this weekend. But if we beat Tampa Bay, Seattle beats Carolina, and then we win next Thursday night, we clinch the freaking division. It's crazy that we can do that already. But yes, we can. We've got Hound594 coming in with the next Super Chat says, I think that there's more pressure on Kyle. He's agreeing with you on that point there, Jack. He should have focused on having a better offensive line instead of drafting Ty Davis Price and Danny Gray. It, you know, the draft is a crapshoot and hindsight is 2020. Certainly the Danny Gray pick feels too early to judge because it was one that felt Taylor made to, to match up with Lance and his ability to, to take those deep shots. And neither Jimmy nor Brock Purdy are, are known for their ability to do so. Maybe we'll get a couple of shots to Danny, but it doesn't seem like he's going to light the world on fire in the remainder of this season. And obviously Ty Davis price uh, not climbing up the ranks, but again, still a little early to say it is fair to criticize those picks could have been used on players that could have contributed this season. Yeah, but he's talking about offensive line, and I disagree with this because I think the offensive line isn't the problem. I mean, it's an interesting piece with the 49ers, right? Their offensive line this year is a better pass protecting unit than they had last year. They're a better pass protecting unit than they had in 2020, and they're better than they were in 2019. So this pass protection side of the 49ers offensive line has gotten better. This group that they have is very good in pass protection. The issue you have with this group is they are not necessarily the people movers that they used to have in the past. They don't right. have – they don't have the left guard that drives people off the ball anymore. The center doesn't necessarily drive people off the ball. Same thing, a right guard. Right guard is the same guy that they've had the last couple of years anyway. But they, they just, with the 49ers, their pass protection, this whole thing with the offensive line, I think people need to stop and step back a little bit and realize this is actually a, one of the better units in the NFL when it comes to protecting the quarterback and what they do. And I think there's just a lot of misunderstanding of the way that offensive line play works. Uh, and like for example, the the sack on um, Jimmy Garoppolo that got injured when he got injured the other day, like that protection was actually run exactly how it's supposed to be run. That was actually the reason that he's getting sacked is because the coverage 
not the not what the offensive line was doing. Right. And 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 it goes back to like the week before where you have the one clip of Michael Glinchy blocking nobody when in reality that's because the blockers all went down. The guy that he was supposed to block went back and there was nowhere for him to go. He, I mean, I would he should have worked inside and maybe helped out there instead of just standing there. But it's not like it's it didn't affect the play, if you know what I'm saying. I, I think this offensive line piece is is a, a much overblown. In a lot of ways. And to me, it's wild because it, it feels like a unit that the 49ers did a great job of piecing it together this season based on what they had to fill from last year. And the results seem to be good. Yeah, well, they well, and, and when you well, the other the other part of it though is you look at the left guard is the guy they they picked they picked up last year, so he was picked up for the future, and he, he's stepped in and he's done a very he's done a very good job. He's been kind of struggling a bit a little bit these last couple of weeks with um, some twists up in front of him, turning his shoulders a little bit too much and stuff like that. So, you know, Banks has been struggling a little bit there. Right. Um, you know, the right guard's a rookie, and they just picked him. I think the one spot that they didn't make a big change is at the center position. Um, you know, they, they they have a very athletic group. They don't necessarily have a group that really just drives people off the ball. That's fair, and that is what is needed within the run game to have those road pavers coming in. I'll just throw this one up here. J49 asked the simple question, is Kinlaw coming back this year? Simple question, probably a complicated answer here. It does seem as though the 49ers are saving their two remaining um, IR activation moves for Elijah Mitchell and Javon Kinlaw. Hence why they haven't put Jimmy Garoppolo on IR, because there is a chance that he could come back. And if they did so, they would have to choose between those three players, only two to return. I've seen the hypothesis that Kinlaw, that they're waiting. They haven't started his practice window, so they're giving him as much time before putting that knee under load. But once they do, the, the speculation that I was reading that makes a lot of sense is waiting until after the 49ers' last game on turf. Obviously, turf has that impact on on joints that natural grass does not. And the last game on turf for the 49ers is in Seattle next Thursday night. That seems like a fair point in time where we will know if Kinlaw is coming back after that. And if that's the case, it would seem the focus was, hey, we're going to we're going to make the playoffs. That's our goal. That's what we're going to do. And we'd like to have Kinlaw available for that stretch. Is that your impression as well, or are you on the fence as to whether we see Javon Kinlaw again this season? I'm very on the fence with it because we haven't seen him out there at all. And I think you're, the point that what you just said could be right on the money. You know, maybe he, maybe there's something that happens after this game in Seattle where everything else is on grass the rest of the year. They they have a hole right now on the defensive line now with Hassan Ridgeway's injury because he's going to be out for an extended period of time. I'll wait. I think I think they were saying he's six to eight weeks uh, on that injury. So he's a guy that could maybe be back in time for the Super Bowl if they get that far or NFC Championship game kind of scenario. So right. uh, they, they have a need there. So I don't I think they're not closing the door on Javon Kinlaw. I would say that if you're asking me and I was betting on it, I would say it's highly unlikely. I am skeptical as well. I just want to hope that that's the case. Uh, To Sean's question here, he says, Rob, isn't there turf in Las Vegas? Surprisingly, no. As cheap as Mark Davis is with that freaking haircut of his, uh, he sprung the extra money to do what Arizona did, which is that uh, grass that they roll outside into the beautiful sun in Las Vegas. I'm sure they have to water it far too much because it is a desert and you're not supposed to have grass in a desert. But no, they have real grass in that stadium, which again is like for for any NFL owner, Jerry frickin' Jones, the billionaire who clearly it doesn't have enough time left in life to spend all of his money is so cheap that he won't pay for it when clearly he can afford it. That's why players are pissed. That's why uh, I'm pissed. I think they should take a stand on it. I think Jerry Jones doesn't actually care about switching to grass. He's just a smart enough businessman that he's saying he doesn't want to switch so that they can use that as leverage to negotiate a, an extra freaking game. And I think that we will see the owners try to get that 18th game slipped into the season. That, that's 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 a really good one. I think the the whole whole move from from, from uh, artificial turf to to grass, if that's something that the uh, NFLPA is going to make a hard stand on, is going to be very interesting to watch. Very, because uh, there's a, are a lot of people who are behind the players on this, and I understand it. I think I've said this to you before. I think once games start getting missed, if 
because this isn't a thing that's going to just be decided in the off season. And, right. Oh yeah, we're going to, we're going to do this. It's going to be something that I think is going to be a long back and forth. Like, I think that if it's one of those things where they probably would even have to strike in order to make it happen. And if the games start getting missed, that's when the, that's when the fans all of a sudden don't, necessarily care about the players quite yeah too much. i support you until you take away my football and then i want you out there on sundays and i'll tell you what i mean i understand that shift i understand don't don't cost me games on sunday it's a guile 56 sneakerhead on the channel coming back in it says rob and jack if purdy wins the next two games we are okay that is a fair statement i believe i i totally believe that that is a fair statement uh, the Niners obviously are in good shape to make the playoffs. Just talking about the fact that they can clinch if a couple of things go their way over these next two weeks. If they do, as Aguayo was saying, and win the next two, and Seattle happens to lose on Sunday against Carolina, Thursday, they would have to lose if we win. That would clinch it for us. So, yes, the next couple are very important in setting us up for that playoff run. Let's get into the next topic here about – this one I was uh, – Wanted to play devil's advocate here for you, for uh, for us, for the listeners, Jack, and have you play both sides of the fence. So this is the uh, the the warning here, the the precursor to it in saying I'm not asking Jack here to give me his actual opinion, although at the end I will be interested to hear which of the two you lean more towards. But I'm talking devil's advocate here, making the case as to why Brock Purdy could absolutely get this team to the promised land or across the bridge to Jimmy's return, whether or not he could come back in the playoffs versus the opposite side, talking about why potentially our expectations should be lower for the rest of the season. So let's start with the negative so we can end on the positive. What are those things you see from Brock Purdy wherein you would caution the faithful if you're trying to make the case against why the 49ers are still in prime uh, driver's seat location to, to take us deep into the playoffs. What are some of those elements you see from Purdy's game that you think could be exploited by NFL defenses? Yeah, the the, the issues that you see with Brock Purdy are there's 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 some uh, inaccuracy issues, um, and we've seen him with some with some bad turnovers in the in the preseason. We haven't seen that really in the. We haven't seen that crop up, but we haven't seen him enough in the regular season to say it's there. I guess you can right. if you want to if you want to point to the interception at the end of the you know the one drive that he had against Kansas City, which was a bad throw. Um, but the thing with with Brock and, and the reason that I kept I feel like he's somewhat of a Nick Mullins with mobility is because of the fact that you see him make these plays and it's like wow that's really exciting and then all of a sudden he makes another play and it's like what the, what what what. What's going on out here? What? Or like, what? Like, yeah, like, like, uh, what is it? Uh, uh, like Vince Lombardi. What the hell going on out here? <laughs> yeah, that was a good Vince Lombardi impression right there, Jack. You've been keeping that one in your back pocket for a while, my friend. <laughs> I gotta, gotta, gotta keep people wanting some more, you know. Yes, yes, indeed. I love it. I love it. All right, so Hound Hound five nine four coming in before we make the case for why he can take us to the promised land. Saying you think we can somehow work out something with Mariota and the Falcons as a backup for Brock? Unfortunately, not. The NFL trade deadline has passed. Uh, they would have to, much like what happened with Baker Mayfield, any quarterback that is going to be released from their team would have to clear the waivers process and. Someone like Mariota, the 49ers are, are lower in the waiver process based on their current record. That resets in week three of the new year. So it's not based on last year's record. It, it is based on current standings. And the 49ers would be low in that waiver process. And therefore, I would assume someone else would grab Marcus Mariota. Certainly, Mariota could try to force his way out of the organization. And if the organization has respect for that player, oftentimes they come to a meeting of the minds, freeing them up for some other opportunity. I would not expect uh, that to happen, nor would I expect if it did for him to make it to the 49ers. Would you say that's a fair summary there, Jack? Yeah, he'd probably be another quarterback for the Rams if that happened. <laughs> right? Hey, <laughs> I haven't seen what the score is right now. Maybe Baker Mayfield is lighting the world on fire. You know he was just waiting to team up with Sean McVay. It was all just part of the master plan. Playing the long game, Jack. <laughs> there you go. Uh, there you go. But, Let's get into Big Ram. The 49ers fans comment here says, are there any cleats that can help with this type of injury to get Jimmy back sooner since he's not a super, super mobile quarterback? 
No, no cleats that I'm aware of. Uh, I will defer to Jack if if he's heard of any special cleats that can help Jimmy Garoppolo. Uh, it is not the Liz Frank injury, so it's not the stability of the foot that's in question. It is a simple fracture if the re-diagnosis is to be believed here. And so what you're looking at is uh, there are things that Jimmy has access to that those of us in the normal world would not unless we were super wealthy. There are special things, special gamma rays out there, not gamma rays, I'm, I'm exaggerating here, but there are things that you can shoot at the foot, at the bone that assist with bone growth. I mean, it sounds like science fiction, but that type of stuff is out there when you have endless amounts of money or access to those resources. So it is fair to wonder the standard time to heal from a bone fracture is six weeks. It is fair to wonder if he could heal a little bit quicker, uh, but then you do have to get back into football playing shape. So I would not expect Jimmy back any sooner than my guess would be six weeks at the earliest. I think it's probably to what Shanahan is saying, probably more in that eight week range. And it's a slim margin to actually see him back out there. How are you feeling right now about the chances of Jimmy Garoppolo making it back onto the field for the 49ers, assuming they do make a playoff run? I think it's pretty slim. I think it's pretty slim. Uh, just, you know, again, like it's it's six to eight weeks. I don't really remember Jimmy Garoppolo being a quick healer and uh, in the injuries that he's that's had in the fair. past. So I don't, I don't think all of a sudden he's going to be healthy and with a broken bone. I don't know if I would expect to see him back this season. Um, I'm going to keep hope alive on my end, Jack, and say that my relentless optimism tells me Jimmy Garofalo will make, but maybe he won't be needed. Maybe Brock Purdy just continues to cook. And, and that's the case that I'm going to ask you to make right now. So let's say we don't need Jimmy Garoppolo, how is it? What do you see within Brock Purdy's game that's going to allow him to to lead this team to the promised land? How can Brock do that for us? He just has a he has a uh, he has a sense about him and that he he's a, a game guy. You know, get get me in the game. I'm going to make plays. I'm not afraid of anything. I, I'm not. There's no situation. This is one of the biggest things when you look at Brock Purdy and you look at the quarterback situation. The Fournier's have with their younger quarterbacks is you've got Brock Purdy who's done everything. He's been in pretty much every situation you can be in when he was at Iowa State. He's been in he's been in, in games that he's been getting his butt whooped. He's been in games in which he's had to try to make big plays in the fourth quarter to win games. He's been in pretty much every situation you can be put in in a football game. You know, and 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 I think that prepared him. I don't think it can it can be a negative at all. And you watch what he does and and there's a there's a it's not like he's just going back and guessing. He knows where he wants to go with the ball. He knows where he's supposed to go. You can see him on film moving people out of the way and things like that with his eyes, like I said on a couple of examples. There's others as well. I, I just think that he's he's a guy who, uh, from that standpoint, if you, if you want to make the case for Brock Purdy, he can make he can make all of the throws that the 49ers need to be made. And he has a mobility that they didn't have with Jimmy Garoppolo. So in some ways – if you want to make it, maybe maybe they're better off because maybe they have some more mobility in that backfield now. Man, I like this admission. I like this change. I th- I, you are selling me on this. And, and I agree with many of those points. Clearly, Kyle Shanahan approved of the aggressive nature of the young rookie signal caller because he chose to keep him over Nate Sudfeld. You, you heard uh, Trent Williams talking about that as well as he was speaking on Brock Purdy. And, and you mentioned it. He is uh, better back there with his wheels, certainly than Jimmy Garoppolo. Not not going to call him a mobile quarterback, but uh, Randon on the, the show last night on my channel pointed out that as far as 10 yard split times go, he was the fastest quarterback at the combine. Uh, he did have, I mentioned it earlier, the 71% completion rate his last year at Iowa State. And you could argue that aggressiveness, the ability to move within the pocket, because the 10 yard split is all about that initial quickness. So he's elusive, if you will. You could argue that the 49ers, with all those skill position players, basically just need a a talented point guard at quarterback, someone to get the ball into the hands of the playmakers. They need John Stockton-level distribution of the rock. Is it fair to say that's basically Brock's strength? 
Yeah, I think he's a little bit more of a gunslinger than 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 Garoppolo in terms of he's going to take some some risks every once in a while, or maybe they've kind of coached that out of him because of the the time that they've had him here with the Four ers But yeah, he's a he's a that's what the Four ers need is a guy that can play point guard. They don't need him necessarily make the big you know they don't need him to be the playmaker. Make the let him help everybody else be the playmaker, and he fits that mold. I love it. Love the optimism. All right, we got a couple of quick hitters to hit this one before we close out. It's obviously a historic matchup. Oh, Are you on, fascinated on. by yeah. the fact that it's Mr. Irrelevant? Did- I've been I've been interrupting you. I'm sorry, but I was going to say you you you, were on, you I thought you were going to give me maybe maybe, maybe it's coming up. Maybe I just screwed up the whole show. Because you were, you were, gonna, you were gonna, I thought you were going to ask me what my what I really thought was going to happen. Oh no, I was going to ask that, and I completely forgot. It's good that you stopped me there because I would have gone on some long diatribe. What do you think between those choices? I had you make the case, and you made a compelling one each way. Which one do you believe is closer to the truth? <laughs> I just want to make sure that we got that out there too. Uh, you had a sense of panic came over me when I see you <laughs> frantically waving. I was like, am I dead on the air? What's going on here? No, please. I do want to know. Absolutely want to know, Jack. So, so I, 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 there's a, there's a, here, here's the thing for me. I, and, and it's probably part of the reason why people think I hate Trey Lance too is that, you know, the state of Missouri, the, the, the state and motto of Missouri is the show me state, right? Yes. And, and that's how kind of what I am. It's like, I want you to show me. I, I mean, it's I, I get that you have a ton of of, of potential. Yeah. Show, me that, show me that it's not just potential. Show me, show me something that it's not just potential. And so that's why when it comes to Brock Purdy, even I'm, I'm very cautious with him because – I think he can be. I think he can do enough for the 49ers to win these games, but I, I need to see it in more than just him coming on. Because we've seen plenty of guys do what he did, where he comes on and he plays really good for a game, but then you have to put him out there week after week after week, and all of a sudden, uh, it starts to show. We, we saw that out, and we've seen that with the Jets, right? With uh, Mike White, they, they in a couple of different years where they they put him out there. He plays really good one week, the next week he plays like dog. Uh, food so we need to see Brock do this a couple of weeks and this is a really really tough week for him against a really good defense and if he can do if he can do it this week and if he can do it next week against Seattle the 49ers are in a very good position because these are the two toughest defenses I think he's going to play the rest of the way I love it that leads right into our our next topic that I'm going to switch up a little bit in the order of things because because I do want to talk about this being a bigger test for for Brock going up against this defense quick question for you how do you feel about Brock's arm strength is it sufficient enough because on the show last night uh, you know Randon used the term noodle arm which had me laughing I'm not gonna lie and I I understand the criticism I don't believe he has a noodle arm I think that is an exaggeration However, I understand the criticism as he is not a deep ball thrower. That's not his skill set. Does he have the arm strength needed to make all the throws? He has a stronger arm than Jimmy Garoppolo. So he, the, I don't. The whole noodle arm thing came from one throw during rookie minicamp, throwing deep, a deep post that was underthrown. I, I was there. I saw it. Um, yeah, but but he. He, just just watch the film that was shot at practice yesterday. He's throwing he through two deep balls going that same direction, put them right on the money. I know he's not throwing the receivers. He's throwing the ball boys, but the, they travel a, per, a pretty good distance. He's got, he's got more than enough arm. I I've stood there and watched him and Jimmy Garoppolo throwing the same routes in practice. And it, it comes out of it. He's, he throws the ball better than Jimmy Garoppolo. Trust me. I love hearing that. And Randall Riley probably loves hearing that as well, because that was his stance last night. He was standing firmly with it. And that is uh, you're being underscored right now, Randy. uh, Randall, you are getting that um, backup that you needed on your stance. Alan Eliza coming in with a quick ask. Robin Jack, great show tonight. Thank you. Do you think Bosa will get over under two and a half sacks on Tom Brady? Debo, that like button. I got to say two and a half on Brady feels like a lot i'm gonna take the under on that i think bosa has at least one sack in this game maybe two i don't think he gets that third on brady brady scott still has himself a quick release even if he is getting sacked quite a bit uh this year any Mm -hmm. any feeling on the over under jack i would probably lean more towards the under because again i'm usually a little more cautious in my in my takes on that kind of stuff most of the time um it really depends on how well the coverage on the back end is for the 49ers because if if unless they're disrupting those routes and 
and making Brady have to hold on the ball, he's going to get the ball out quick enough for, for him not to get hit as much as we think he will. So I'm going to say probably we'll go with the under. Yes. By the way, I didn't get this in earlier, but anytime there's a good joke, a funny line, I'm putting it in. In response to Will, uh, Will Garoppolo be back at the end of the year? Obviously, uh, Jack, less optimistic than myself and me admitting I'm being, being foolishly optimistic. But Thomas Luttrell came in to say, Rob, this is Jimmy. I don't need surgery. Oh, wait. Yes, I do. Garoppolo we're talking about here. Shots fired, but I got to say, like you landed that joke. That that absolutely hits with me, so I had to get it on there. All right, so as I said, you you, you set up the idea of, of transitioning this topic of, of Brock's bigger test. Do you believe to be that case? Clearly, the Bucs have a better defense than, than Miami. They also have all week to prepare for Brock as the quarterback, so no element of unprepared surprise. First and foremost, let me just ask you that. How different do you think it is for an NFL defense to go in practicing against a rookie uh, quarterback, practicing to play a rookie quarterback, whereas uh, versus the prior week where Jimmy Garoppolo goes down and now you're just facing Brock Purdy, who you probably haven't looked at tape on? I I think it's easier if if, if Purdy had played maybe two or three weeks. Uh, and you could really have something there. Uh, he only played one game. There's not, right. it's not like you look at that and you're like, look, every time he does this, this is what's happening or something like that. There's nothing yet that I think you can pick up on with, with him. Uh, so I don't think it's, I think it's a bigger test for him, but I don't think if there's anything right now that necessarily helps out Tampa Bay other than the fact that they're just a really good defense. Yeah, absolutely. A good defense. Do you expect Brock to struggle in this one? Yeah, I think it's gonna. I, I think it's gonna. I think this is gonna be one of those games where. Um, remember, like, I, we didn't talk, so I don't, you know. But after that Saints win, where it was only thirteen points against the Saints, and there was just right. a lot of, there's just been a lot of hand wringing about that. This is one of those games that's gonna bring a, hand, a lot of hand wringing about this Rams offense because I do not see either team really, really scoring very many points in this game. It is a great defense, and the other side of it is obviously the 49ers' number one defense, which I'm always excited to say, to call, regardless of whatever category I've got to talk about it in. But David Lombardi did a great job of pointing out on Twitter just how stacked the Niners' defense is. So I wanted to share this because there are a bunch of obscure stats that maybe not everyone's familiar with. We have the number one edge rusher in the NFL in Nick Bosa. We have three defensive linemen that are in the top 25 of Pash. Pass rush produ- productivity. That's a mouthful. They have the number one linebacker in pass breakups. They have two linebackers in the top 10 of PFF's grading for linebackers. They have the number one run defending cornerback in the league in Mooney Ward. And they have a top 10 cornerback in PFF grade. They are absolutely stacked. Can the 49ers number one defense contain Brady and the Bucks. Will they hold them to one of these games where it just feels like Brady and the Bucks offense is disjointed? Will they shut down the Bucks? is my overall long-winded question. Yeah. I don't, yeah. That's the thing with, with, with Tampa Bay, their offenses look disjointed and, and discombobulated all season long. I think you'll see that continue on Sunday. It is. It's one of the worst offenses in the NFL this year. Uh, according to the research I did prior to the show, league worst offense. Do you see any any merit to the fact that this is a historic matchup? We're talking about Tom Brady, the greatest of all time to this generation, at least, mm-hmm. um, against Mr. Irrelevant. They're, you know, 49ers favored by three and a half points in this one. Do you put any stock in the added motivation for Brady? that would light a fire underneath him and the Bucks' league worst offense. And the fact that this is a hometown game, probably his last family is going to be in attendance. There's perceived disrespect of people talking about Mr. Irrelevant being Mr. Relevant in this game against him. Is it, is it fair to wonder if, if the goat has a little magic in him? Do you worry about that at all? Or is this defense for the 49ers uh, ferocious enough that you're not terribly concerned. Well, I got to first say, I take it a little personally that you say this generation's goat. You're almost like you're making me out to be an old goat myself. I mean, come on now. <laughs> no, you and I are the same generation. <laughs> I'm talking about the younger people. No, no I know. I'm, I'm, I know. I'm giving you a hard time. I, I think that I think that the, yeah, there's definitely going to be some uh, some motivation for Brady playing at home. 
I know, you know, it's not home like in Tampa Bay, but in front of right. where he, in, in the class, close as he can get to the stadium that he grew, grew up in against the team that he grew up watching, there's definitely going to be some of that there. Uh, but then they step between the lines and you've got what you've got. And I, I don't, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers really miss Bruce Arians on offense. They, they, they need a guy that can, ma- can manage this offense. And that's what Bruce Arians did. And the way that this offense is right now, it's just, it's too pass heavy. And they, uh, you know, Tom Brady's a, a very good quarterback, but they're relying, relying way too much on him considering all the issues they've had along the offensive line this season. And it really took a freaking miracle to come back against the uh, the Saints in their most recent matchup. That was another rabbit out of a hat for for Brady, but it also took some incompetence on on New Orleans side of the ball. Yeah, and and that's I, I mean, again that's where 49ers are such a good team. I, I just don't see I don't see that kind of thing happening on on Sunday again if that was to happen. I love it. We got a couple of super chats to close out on Jack. This has been a phenomenal show. Bro Montana sneakerhead here on the channel says cheers fellas. I'll be at the game. While I'm stoked to see the goat, I can't wait to see Bosa bring him down. Let's go Niners. Yes, that will be fun. Hey, I'm sure that Bosa is looking forward to sacking the goat. I'm sure he's trying for those three sacks because a man probably wants to set the single season sack record for the NFL. He looks poised to set the sack record for the 49ers. I'm pretty excited that if he just continues on pace, he will hit that 20 sack mark that I predicted early on in some of my predictions. I feel like that wasn't as bold of a prediction as I play it up to be, but damn it, Jack, I'm going to play it up all I can if I get it right. Yeah, I think this is this is a, this is I'm I'm excited. I've never seen Tom Brady play live in person, so I'm excited. That's just phenomenal to, to, to see him play uh, at Levi Stadium. It's a, one of those games I've kind of had marked on the the calendar all year long. And, and yes, I would love to see uh, Nick Bosa do his thing that he's been doing all year long. He's just been fantastic. You mentioned it already. The sacks where he is, he's he he missed he's missed a game and a half yet. He leads the league in sacks. He had, leads the league in quarterback hits, and he's tied for second in tackles for loss. I mean, the guy's just a stud. It's wild. Every game that he's played in its entirety has at least one sack. So it's not as if he ran up the score against inferior competition. He's Mr. Consistency. And I absolutely love it. I expect, I don't expect, let me walk that back before I complete that sentence. I am very optimistic about the way in which he is going to finish this season, helping propel us into the playoffs We'll close out on a compliment. Jaguayo 56 sneakerhead here on the channel. Great dude coming in to say, Rob, great show for the dynamic duo. Stay blessed. Thank you so much. I hope you and your family stay blessed as well. Jack, this was a phenomenal show. It really builds up my excitement for what should be a good defensive matchup, even if it feels like one of those games where both offenses aren't putting up the points that we want to see. I get excited about Smash Mouth football, and I would think that's what we're in for against Tampa Bay on Sunday. Yeah, I think buckle up because if you thought the uh, yeah this is this has all the markings of Week Three all over again, 49ers Broncos. That's kind of what I think this, we're we're going towards here. So be ready for this to be one of those games that that you're you're gripping onto your seat or, or wanting to throw your uh, your remote at the TV a time or two. So hold on to it. Don't throw it at the TV because that's expensive but it's going to be a fun game. I'm looking forward to it. That's the way I feel this is going to break out, but I like closing on the optimism. Sean 9519 ers with the last super chat coming in. Tom, Tom Brady checks down every other throw. They can't run. This game might get ugly. If Purdy plays like last week, I can see 31 to six, if not 17, six Tom Brady, no touchdowns. Well, I'm glad I picked up an alternate okay. quarterback in one of my fantasy leagues where I was stuck with Tom Brady the last couple of weeks. That wasn't pretty. But I I think it's going to be a little closer. Jack, how you feeling? Thirty one to six. Wait, do I, what do you think? Come on, Sean. I, I like Sean, but <laughs> 30, 30, giving 31, him a little grief. Thirty one points. That's like Patrick Mahomes against the Buccaneers number right there. That's 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 wild stuff. That's not going to happen. They're not thirty. The only way they get to thirty one is if they score a couple of defensive touchdowns here. Or or, or I, yeah, but hey, I mean, if it's thirty one six, I'm not going to complain. So no, Sean, if it's thirty one to six. You. We're but, both going to say, Sean, you were right about that. I, I'm not. I'm not laughing. I, you know, it's cool, but I'm just saying, 31. When you look at what the Buccaneers' defense has allowed this year to stay that 
that Purdy would put up 31 if he played the way that he played last week. Mm, if he plays the way he played last week, he puts up 20 again. Hey, I'd be comfortable with that as well, as long as our defense plays as they should. Jack, thank you so much for being on here today. We will be on your channel Monday at 7 p.m. I am very much looking forward to that and looking forward to continuing this trend week in, week out of the Thursday night 7 p.m. slot. It is going to be the hammerhead hour going forward. Perfect. I'm looking forward to it. I can't wait. And Sean got back to me, says it doesn't matter how they get there. They're, as long as they score 31 as a team, let's go, Sean. I'm, I'm, I'm with you. Let's go. Let's go, yes. Niners, score 31 points on Sunday, win this thing 31-6 so that I can get my write-up done early. Yeah, you won't hear Jack or I complain if it is 31-6, to six, Niners. Let me tell you that. We will be happy as clams, my friend. All right, Jack. Well, thank you so much. We will be on Monday on your channel. Do you have anything coming up in the near future that you want to plug on the channel? I'll be doing a show tomorrow with uh, with Rohan. It's one of those we 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 actually do it on both our channels at the same time. So nice. to subscribe to check into our show. I think we're I think we've got it planned for about three o'clock tomorrow. Uh, I'll make sure I tweet it out for everybody there. I'll put it on my on my channel as well in the community section. So so check it out. It'll be fun. And then keep just keep a look at the channel. I've changed some things up around, so I do a lot more. Um, I do a lot of short videos of, as far as updates and things like that when I can get to it and. Uh, so keep it, keep an eye on the channel for updates and uh, we'll pregame on Sunday, post game afterward, afterwards. So keep it locked in. Love it. I, I, I'm thrilled about that lineup for tomorrow. Big fan of Rohan and obviously a big fan of yours, Jack. I will try to tune into that one myself because I'm guessing there'll be some great information. All of Jack's links are down below in the description of this video. Do me that favor of hitting the like button on your way out and then going down there to subscribe to Jack's channel, follow him on Twitter, hit the notification bell on both of our channels, and just tune in for all these Hammerhead shows because they are badass, my friends. Uh, that closes us out. Beautiful show. I'm thrilled for this weekend's matchup. I will not be back on tomorrow, but we'll have the Sneakerhead call-in show on Saturday, pregame, postgame, Sunday. Looking forward to it. Until then, you guys all know the drill. Cheers, faithful. <laughs>